The Unshackled Waves, episode 103. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Uh, Queensland Election Day is almost here in what has been a closely watched campaign. It has been an uncommon election as it is a three-way race between Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk's Labour government, the Liberal National Opposition led by Tim Nichols, and Pauline Hanson's One Nation led by LNP defector Steve Dixon. The two most likely election outcomes are a slim Labour majority government or an LNP One Nation coalition. Since One Nation is polling at up to 20%, with no pr- firm prediction on where their preferences will go, anything is still possible. The issues that have dominated the campaign are the state government support for the Adani coal mine in North Queensland, as well as the usual state government issues of infrastructure and service delivery. As you will now be aware, The Unshackled is hosting a Queensland election night live stream as the results come in. But before then, we thought we'd have a comprehensive election preview uh, where we not just go into the issues of the campaign, but also the problems in Queensland that are being ignored. To do this, we thought we'd invite on the show an expert in Queensland politics, Graham Young, who is the executive director of the Brisbane-based free market think tank, the Australian Institute for Progress, which produces research on Queensland public policy. Graham is also the chief editor of the website Online Opinion and has been a political consultant and campaigner in Queensland for many years. Now, at the beginning of the show, I have to make an apology for the uh, poor audio quality on uh, Graham's end. Uh, There was not a good uh, connection. Uh, For people who are watching the video version, you can see that I even switched uh, uh, video locations uh, so I could have a stronger internet connection, but it still didn't work. So uh, hopefully uh, you can still understand uh, Graham and still enjoy the chat. Graham, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Now, the Palaszczuk Labor government was first elected in January uh, 2015, and it was widely seen as uh, providing a level of uh, stability after what a lot of people in the media called the turbulence of the the Campbell Newman uh, LNP one-term government. But what is the truth about the Anastasia Palaszczuk government? What has their performance been like? Well, basically... The few things that they've been that they've done have been tricks to appear like, like they're doing something. In fact, apart from hiring public servants, uh, described as a do nothing, a friend of mine who works in a major law firm uh, recounted to me that uh, when the election was called, one of his partners said, "Well, that'll be the first decision they've actually made." And uh, Queensland, uh, it still has quite a. Uh, deteriorating budget uh, situation, which was they tried to address in Campbell Newman's time as Premier, but it just seems to have been forgotten about. Well, it hasn't exactly been forgotten about. We put a letter out at the beginning of the election saying here's a list of issues that we'd like to see the political parties address. Uh, And when I say we, it was a number of people, including Professor Tony Macon, who was in the Australian during the the week talking about the debt up here. And also, uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk, she's claimed that uh, the reason for the growth in the public service is because she's uh, delivering uh, better uh, better frontline services. That's the line she's come up with. Uh, what, what exactly uh, is the reality of that? Well, the reality is that we've got the, um, I think, the greatest concentration of public servants per head of population. For about 20% of head of Victoria. And um, uh, you can't tell me that's all in frontline services. And in fact, the more people you've got in the public service, the harder it is to actually um, finance frontline services because there's obviously a growth in administrative staff there that's not in some of the other states. 
Now, Anastasia Palaszczuk, she's proceeding with uh, a 50% state renewable energy target, despite the problems that have happened in uh, South Australia and the, the debate at the, uh, the the federal level over energy affordability and reliability. Uh, why, why is it so important for her to go down this path, given that these challenges that are occurring? I think the reason for Anastasia is that the Labor seats in Brisbane from the Green, uh, the seat of South Brisbane, which is the seat that Jackie Trad, who's the Deputy Premier, and some would say the real power in the government holds, uh, the seat of Maywa, which is held by the Liberal Party, Scott Emerson, uh, and then the seat of um, uh, what's it called? Um, it's a new name, Connell, I think. It used to be the old seat of Brisbane, which is held by Grace Grace, who's a, another up and comer. Uh, so the three seats there with the Greens are competitive. Uh, so, so the Labor Party's pitching, especially under the influence of Jackie Trad, towards those sorts of voters. Uh, so making promises about central approvals, uh, even if they don't really think they can be achieved, is something they're going to do. I guess. The other factor is that Mark Bailey, who's the electricity of what they're doing on these issues, uh, was quite clear on Monday. Um, our institute brought out a report it's based on AEMO modelling, so it's the Australian Energy Markets or Operator uh, modelling, which shows that to get 50% renewables, you've got to close a number of power stations. And that wouldn't be news to most people, that if you're going to have point of 50% renewables, is you are going to close power stations. That's the whole reason you're doing it. Um, but they didn't want to admit that because that might cause problems in the areas where the power stations are. They so had Bailey on radio saying, we're going to make 50% renewables and we are not going to close a power station. So that's the sort of politics, that's the sort of fantasy that the government's existing in and without proper scrutiny from the media and um, uh, they're getting away with it to a certain extent. But it's not just a political spin, they actually want to, to do this and that's still quite dangerous. Um, they want to do it. Um, I don't have a problem with 50% renewables if it's affordable and if it's reliable, and, and that's where the problem arises. Uh, what we've seen around the world is that most large countries, once they get up to about 40%, or when I say large countries, I'm also thinking of California, uh, which is uh, used to be the 17th largest economy in the world, I'm not quite sure where it sits now. Um, you get this instability in the network for a number of reasons. Um, and in California at the moment, um, they've got such a problem that they're producing so much renewable energy in the middle of the day that there's very little demand for conventional power generation. But then at peak periods, the renewables generally aren't available and the um, conventional power has to be ramped up really quickly. You actually have gas-fired power generators there going broke. And in fact, you had gas-fired uh, power generator in South Australia at Pelican Point. Uh, that went broke as well for similar sorts of reasons. Um, so I don't have a problem with 50%. If you can develop it, if you can deliver it at a reasonable cost and if you can guarantee people uh, continued and reliable supply, and that's the problem. With current technologies, we can't. And with the civil technologies, I very much suspect that we can't. And what a lot of people don't know about the uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk government is that it actually was a minority government. The 2015 election was a, a hung parliament with the uh, balance of power being held by an independent, uh, Peter Wellington, who supported Labor. Has that had an effect on the, the government to uh, legislate effective policy? Um, well, a minority government, they started off as a minority government and then they subsequently made themselves more minority because they lost a couple of members who then went and sat on, went and sat on the uh, crossbench. There was uh, Rob Pine, who's the member for Cairns, who claimed he'd been bullied by Jackie Trad, who was the member for um, 
uh, South Brisbane and Deputy Premier that I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, they lost Billy Gordon, who's the member for um, Cook, um, over a number of issues to do with uh, alleged spousal abuse and non-payment of um, 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 child support payments. So they went from being vaguely minority to significantly minority. But the fact of the matter is that the minor parties, which is the Catter Australia Party, uh, and, and then the independents, and that includes the Speaker, Mr Wellington, have supported them sufficiently that they've got most of what they wanted through. Um, as we find with minority governments all around the country, that parties and major parties can actually make accommodations and, and run a government which is, is reasonable. And a government which large slices of the public actually likes to see because they feel they've got perhaps a little bit more control over it. Now the Liberal National Party, they were quite shaken when they uh, were turfed out of office after one term despite winning 78 out of 89 seats in uh, 2012. They, they claim that they've learnt their lesson from, from the Campbell Newman years and they're, they're going to do things differently if they uh, back, get back into government uh, this election. But, what, what exactly have they learned from the Campbell Newman years? Is it the right lessons, in your opinion? Um, well, I think the major problem with the Campbell Newman period was, well, there were two major problems. One was failure to communicate that there was a problem that needed to be fixed in the first place before coming along with a solution. And the other was just trying to do everything at the one time. Uh, and the problem with that was that at certain times it produced a sense of chaos um, and at other times it uh, produced a, um, a sense of, um, um, well, the, the t community was in turmoil. So there were three or four agenda items on the go at the one time and it was relatively easy for the Labor opposition and their union allies to kick up a, a fuss on all of those issues um, and it made it look like the government was at war with the community when in fact the community was by and large I think happy with the measures they just weren't happy with the way they were being implemented so I think they have learned from that process uh, it's just a pity that they didn't learn this other side of the last election rather than this side and the other factor is that Campbell Newman's not there anymore and one of the things I realised when Campbell went was that it was like taking the energizer uh, batteries out of the energizer bunny. Uh, the whole thing slowed down completely. Campbell was the big uh, benefit or the big weapon that the previous government had, and he and he was the uh, he was both. He made them what they were. He made them electable but he also made them unelectable. Obviously, after uh, Campbell Newman at 2015, he, he lost his seat, so that was uh, the end of his political career. And then the, uh, the LNP, Lawrence Springboard, was the, the leader for a while. Then we have uh, Tim Nichols, who was the treasurer uh, under Campbell Newman. Uh, so what is the, the policy platform that he's taken to, to this election and what's he promised to do differently? Uh, well, I think one of the problems he's had is that they ran away from Campbell's legacy as well as Campbell. Um, so, to a certain extent, this election's been fought under a Labor agenda. Um, so they allowed the Labor Party to demonise a lot of the things that they did. Particularly the idea that they might have a sale and lease back on some assets, which would have provided Queensland with money to use for much needed infrastructure development and a number of other things, plus uh, paying back some of the debt. So they allowed that to be demonised. They accepted the uh, discourse that the ALP was forcing on them, that this was a bad thing to do, even though uh, exit polling that I did after that election showed that only about 14% of people made a decision on the basis of asset sales. And those people were mostly people who were already going to vote Labor. So it wasn't a vote changer. It wasn't the issue that made the difference last election. But they ran away from that. And what that's meant 
is that a lot of the things that they needed to talk to electors about because they need changing, they basically accepted that they would have to remain. So today we've had two budget costings come down, one from the government and one from the opposition. They're quite similar. The difference is that the government's actually increasing taxes uh, on a few wealthy minorities like people that own buildings over $10 million or people that buy cars worth $100,000 or more. And <coughs> pardon me, the opposition uh, has produced a budget which uh, gives them savings over the ALP of about $600 million. Uh, most of that's achieved by doing away with one capital works project of the government which is the Cross River Rail Tunnel and also looking for a 1% efficiency dividend out of the uh, public service, which should be reasonably easy to achieve. So it's a, a gently, gently approach, but it's also an approach which leaves a lot of the bad things that Anastasia's, Anastasia Palaszczuk has done in place. Uh, and that means that Queensland's not going to improve its position any time in the next three years at the very least. Now, obviously, in Queensland, it's called the Liberal National Party because there used to be the Liberal Party and the National Party, but they made the decision in, it was uh, 2008, uh, I believe, when they decided to uh, merge. Now, you're actually a former uh, vice president of the, the Queensland Liberal Party. Has the merger worked out because it still doesn't exist at the federal level. LNP federal members can choose to caucus with the Liberal or National parties. How, in 2017, has it been a smooth merger now? Um, well, I, I was opposed to the merger and I'm not a member of the LNP. I was actually expelled by the Liberal Party um, for basically factional reasons. Um, and um, I've never been motivated to rejoin. Um, look, I don't think the LNP was the ideal solution, but it is the only game in town. Um, there is no alternative to it. In Queensland, unlike every other state, um, you had two non-Labor parties that were reasonably even in size, um, so there was a lot of jockeying to see who could actually run the show. It ended up being the National Party, but they were the rural, not the metropolitan, uh, non-Labor Party. And But as a result of running the government, most of the funding went to them. So they actually had the strength over the Liberal Party in uh, campaigns. So there was tension through the, um, well, the 60s and the 70s, once J.B. Alfie Peterson got there, it was fairly friendly. Uh, in, the, in 57 when uh, it first came together. Um, worked reasonably well, I think, um, up until the probably the early 80s. Um, then in 83, there was a split in the coalition. The Liberal Party actually went to the crossbench. Um, and they had, I think it was nine members at that stage, It then subsequently went down to six. At one stage, they had three members in Parliament. The Liberal Party almost disappeared in the state. They subsequently came back and, and had more members, but they were always more fragile. The National Party had safe seats. Even in a bad election, they'd still maintain most of their strength. Whereas the Liberal Party had most of the swinging seats. So what would happen is in a bad result, the Liberal Party would go right down. In a good result, they'd have almost as many seats as the National Party been saying, well, why shouldn't we have more say in government? Um, so that relationship had to be managed. Uh, in the 95 election, when I was vice president, um, we had quite a good coalition relationship with, with the National Party. And in fact, we did the strategy for the campaign. Uh, so that worked well. Uh, but then after the 98 route with uh, One Nation coming in and uh, uh, taking a lot of seats from us and the ALP, uh, five from us and six from the ALP, I think it was, uh, and then we went into opposition, then the old tensions resurfaced and, and Lawrence Springborg um, campaigned to bring the two parties together again, which he managed to do. And um, he pointed out to me when he launched uh, the Menzies Research Centre book, I think it was called the, the Forgotten Speeches. He launched them in Brisbane for the Menzies Research Centre and I said, Lawrence, 
you're a gnat. What are you doing launching this book of liberal essays? And, you know, Robert Menzies regarded his work as unfinished. He wanted to bring the country party, as it was then, into the tent. He said, I finished Robert Menzies' work. Um, and I think that, you know, that said something about Lawrence and his approach, and where he actually saw himself on the political spectrum. Um, so that's what we've got at the moment. Um, but I think there is a bit of leakage around the edges in that the old coalition arrangement allowed the National Party to pitch for a demographic that the Liberal Party couldn't comfortably get and bring it across to the, the Liberal Party in the cities. And it also allowed the Liberal Party to, to pitch for a demographic that the Nats couldn't necessarily get too easily and bring it across to the, the Nats in the country. So it was a good arrangement. Um, some of those people have peeled off and they're now in One Nation or the Catter Party. Uh, so that's creating some issues, but you're not going to pull the parties apart again. You're not going to go to a situation that you've got in New South Wales or Victoria or Western Australia. Uh, but in those states, it's completely different because the Liberal Party is quite clearly the dominant party and there's no chance of the National Party ever challenging that dominant position. So. The National Party in New South Wales is resigned to that. In Victoria, you get the occasional breakouts. And um, South Australia, the Nats virtually don't exist. In Western Australia, they go fairly on the Liberal Party from time to time. But it doesn't matter that much because the, the Liberal Party is so dominant. The One Nation factor is strong in Queensland. They've been polling at around 15 to 20% of the uh, primary vote. Now, Queensland doesn't have a uh, upper house, so it's difficult for minor parties to uh, get elected. But given One Nation is polling so strongly and in specific areas, they've got a good chance of picking up, well, Pauline Hanson, she said a target of a dozen uh, uh, seats uh, in the 1998 state election, uh, One Nation uh, 111, so they have done it before. But why are they so popular in Queensland? I mean, what exactly do they stand for that, uh, that appeals to voters? Um, well, they're, they're a protest party. They're a party that stands for none of the above. They used to have a phrase for the Labor and Liberal parties, they used to call them the Labor All Party. Um, so that's where they sit. Um, if they get too close to government, it damages their support. And you saw that in Western Australia where they actually did a deal with the Liberal Party and it took the top off them. Uh, they still polled creditably. Or it was it looked like they were going to poll. Um, but I think there's, there's some considerations that you, you're missing there, Tim, um, and that most commentators are. So in 1998, when they got 11 seats, they polled about 23% of the vote. At the moment, the latest uh, reach tell, I think, had them on 18%. But, and this is the critical thing, it had the Catter Australia Party on about 4%. And the Catter Australia Party didn't exist in 1998. So you add them to One Nation, you're up to 22%. You're in very similar territory to where One Nation was in 1998. It's just spread over two parties, but they're two parties which have uh, come to an accord and are swapping preferences. So they obviously see each other as fairly similar and standing outside and looking at them, uh, I can't tell the difference. Uh, the only difference is the Catter Party and the One Nation Party have two different numbers. But when you look at their agendas, they're very similar. Um, so that's one factor. The other factor is that in 1998, uh, the major parties, and there were three of them, because the Liberal and National parties hadn't merged, they added up to 70%. In the most recent polling, they only add up to 65%. So that means that there's more potential for third parties to sneak into second place. So it's not likely that One Nation is going to win a seat on first preferences. They're not polling high enough for that. And in fact, in 98, there was only one seat they won on first preferences, and that was for Ambar, which was Joe's old seat. But there were special reasons for that, um, which aren't being repeated this elector, uh, election. Um, Baramba is uh, now the seat in Nanango, which is held by Deb Freckington, who's the LNP deputy. 
but it's, it's an entirely different story there. So there's no show of one nation winning that seat. Um, so everything else was done on preferences. With the major party vote being depressed on both sides, you know, the Labor Party might be on 35% or 33 the Liberal Party might be on 31 you know, They are terrible first preferences vote for parties that see themselves as major parties. You can't win government without a whole string of things going away from that sort of first preference vote. But what it means is that it's easier for these minor parties to get into the second spot and then with preferences leapfrog over number one to win the seat. Uh, so my read of it is that we're probably in similar territory to what happened in 98. The only difference is that this election, the ALP has said they'll preference against One Nation in all seats. Uh, so the issue then becomes, will that uh, vote, will Labor voters follow the card? And will the Labor Party actually hold to its promise? Now, I'm sure it will on the official card, but what you get with an ALP campaign is you get the uh, political party campaign and then you get all these other campaigns run by trade unions um, and other groups like GetUp. And I'm sure in a lot of critical seats they'll be out there running alternative how to vote strategies suggesting to people that um, they preference one nation to try and knock a Liberal off because it's asymmetrical at the moment. The Liberals are preferencing one nation in 50 seats so that gives One Nation a better chance against ALP members in those seats. ALP is not preferencing uh, One Nation in any seat. That gives the lives arguably a better position. So if you're a tough operator in a union or if you're in get up, then you're more than likely to say, how do we fix this? run a third party campaign. So we won't know how that plays out until um, Monday, uh, Sunday morning, if then. Uh, the boogeyman that Anastasia Palaszczuk has tried to uh, create in this campaign is an LNP One Nation uh, a coalition government. That's what she keeps repeating in her campaign speeches. But like the, hypothetically, if that did occur, how would One Nation try to influence a influence the LNP or even hypothetically a, a Labor Party in government? What exactly would they be after? Yeah, look, I think there's some weaknesses in, in that pitch that she's making. It's a pitch that worked very well back in 98, um, but 20 years on, One Nation's become a lot more mainstream. Uh, people even let their kids watch Pauline Hanson on morning TV while they're eating their wheat bits. Uh, she's not as scary as she used to be. And you have the uh, Speaker, Labor Member of Parliament, um, member for uh, Ipswich West, um, actually, um, um, well, giving Pauline a cuddle yesterday on, on TV. Um, and you've also got a government that has done business with the Catters, who are a bit hard to tell from One Nation. So she's not a, in a strong position on that. Um, to a certain extent, you can probably judge what One Nation will do on the basis of what the Catters have done. You can also judge One Nation in terms of what they're doing in federal parliament. And we've got a good test case as to whether you can work with One Nation. And Malcolm Turnbull is, out of all the Liberal leaders I can think of over the last 30 years, the one furthest away from One Nation. Yet he seems to be able to work with them reasonably well in the Senate. And I think there's a good reason for that. But One Nation culturally fit better with the LNP than they do with any other party. They're a party full of people who are essentially middle class or concerned that they're not middle class enough and they have some um, economic management tenets that they hold in common with the LNP and one of those is that you shouldn't spend money that you don't have and another is that you shouldn't borrow money that you can't pay back. So when it comes to fiscal issues, One Nation tends to be on the LNP side of things. When it comes to social issues, they tend to be on the LNP side of things. No, they, wouldn't have too many problems with Corrie Bernardi, for example, or Tony Abbott. A um, few more problems with, uh, with Malcolm Turnbull, but you know, we're up in Queensland here and uh, uh, they'd be fairly comfortable, I think, on social issues with most of the LNP members. So it really only comes down to issues like immigration 
where there might be some tension and, and these days their concern with immigration is with Islamic immigration and that's why it's spread across the community, across the left and the right from polling that I've done. You know, Islamic community they friendly, they're not women friendly. So even Greens voters are a bit concerned about um, Islamic immigration. So that's a different issue. And then there's the protection of so-called populist issue. Well, if you look at the way the Labor Party is conducting itself at the moment, it's moving in the protectionist direction. The state government here uh, introduced a preferential purchasing policy for state government uh, purchases, which gives manufacturers and suppliers from Queensland up to a 30% pricing advantage, because just because they live locally, and is in breach apparently of our free trade agreement with New Zealand. Did Anastasia Palaszczuk care about that? No. Um, did the public care about it? Well, they didn't appear to. So the things which really upset the public about One Nation, and which could be a problem uh, for the LNP, are immigration, which has a more widespread concern and which is a federal issue anyway, and trade, uh, uh, and a state issue, um, but where you've already seen the influence of that in the, the state uh, government and it hasn't created a public outcry. So, you know, I, I think, there's a, as you said, there's a boogeyman there, uh, but the reality behind the boogeyman is that when you look at them, they're pretty much like the rest of us. Let's talk about some of the issues of the campaign. Now, probably the one that's uh, been reported on the, the most is the uh, Queensland uh, government's support for the Adani coal mine in North Queensland. Uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk, she made the uh, decision to veto a, a federal uh, loan. And we, we talked uh, a bit earlier about that, uh, that Labor are under threat from the Greens in the inner city, which is, uh, one of the reasons they're, they're going cold on uh, Adani. Um, well, is this a important project for, for Queensland? Uh, yeah, the Adani project is, um, particularly for regional Queensland. It's important on a number of issues. There's an employment aspect to it. The Greens will tell you that the employment figures are overstated. Um, they possibly are, but they're, they're not inconsiderable and they're not limited to the people that work on the mine. You know, a lot of people in Brisbane, a lot of professional people in Brisbane make their money out of the mining industry. So that's number one. Number two is that the Carmichael mine, which is the Adani mine, is in the Galilee Basin, which is a new coal province in Queensland. The railway line, which is causing the controversy, will be for the use of Adani and the five other companies that have mines in there that they can start. And one of the things about mining is that without the infrastructure to move your minerals to somewhere where they can be processed and exported or used in some other way, you don't have an asset. So the fact of that railway line going in, which depends on the Carmichael mine going ahead, uh, means that there's another five companies uh, most in Australia, who will suddenly have a, an asset value there that wasn't there before, and they'll be employing Australians, and they'll be earning export income. So that's the second thing. The third thing is the issue of sovereign risk. Um, we're hollowing out our economy at the moment. There's fewer and fewer people in manufacturing, and the sort of manufacturing that used to uh, employ men particularly, you know, skilled manual workers. Um, we rely on our mineral exports and our agricultural exports for our standard of living. Um, and, and that means we need to develop as many of them as we can. We can't do that on our own capital. We need to import capital from around the world. And that's been the history of Australia for 200 years that we've got ahead by bringing capital in. Um, but that capital doesn't have a shortage of places that it can invest. And if we make it too difficult, if we make it unreasonably difficult for them to bring the capital here, they'll go elsewhere. The jobs will go elsewhere, and our standard of living will go down. Uh, so there's three good reasons why it's an important project, and they're not just to do with jobs in the local area. 
And obviously at the state level, uh, infrastructure is, is talked a lot about, which is uh, a lot of the time a, a buzzword. Uh, but what, what's the reality on uh, like who, uh, where does the infrastructure need to, need to be and who is uh, pr promising it in the, the right areas? Uh, well, Queensland up until recently has had some of the fastest population growth and Australia has, I think it's the fastest population growth in the OECD. It's one of the fastest population growths in the whole world. Um, and you need the infrastructure to keep up and it hasn't been. And it's, it's actually population growth is a policy that's set by the federal government but the cost of it for accommodating it is mostly borne by the state governments. Uh, we see part of that reflected in rising house prices is by no means not the only reason the house prices are rising but is a, a problem supplying enough housing. Um, but in the areas where we have supplied enough housing is a problem supplying enough roads uh, and also schools and hospitals and those sorts of things. So infrastructure is, is definitely an uh, issue. If you live in South East Queensland when you try to go north and south of Brisbane, there are issues on the M1 in both directions. Um, from Brisbane down to the, to the New South Wales border and from Brisbane up to the Sunshine Coast. So there's a desperate need to fix that up. Uh, there are, it's not just the time that commuters are spending on the road, it's the time that the trucks carrying goods and so on are spending on the road. That is a, a dead weight on the economy. Um, but North Queensland also has a desperate need of um, infrastructure. Now the, the Ross Highway, which is the main highway into Townsville, when you get, get a decent downpour of rain, it floods. You know, can you imagine, here is the largest city outside Brisbane and the main highway into it when you get a decent downpour floods. No wonder they're upset and looking at voting for one nation. So you know, that's an infrastructure issue. There's water problems in it in a lot of the states. We haven't built a decent dam since Wivenhoe and that was 1986 or something like that. The population in the meantime has ballooned perhaps 50%. Uh, so the LNP are actually promising dams. That's a problem for the ALP because uh, Greens don't like dams. Uh, I'm not sure what their alternative is, probably solar uh, powered uh, desal plants, but uh, the best solar powered de desal plant in my view is uh, uh, rain which falls into a dam. Uh, and there, there's a need for that. There's a need to develop some of our agricultural areas so that they can be more productive and again contribute to the, the export. So yes, infrastructure is a, a big issue in this campaign. Uh, but the parties have constrained themselves by ruling out asset recycling as a way of funding the new infrastructure. So there are assets that they can sell, uh, but both sides uh, for different reasons have sworn off from it and that gives them a problem. Uh, so is which has managed to sell or recycle some of its assets, it's carrying ahead. So all sorts of capital works which will make the uh, city of Sydney and, and the surrounds much more attractive for investment. Uh, Brisbane and Queensland is not doing that work, can't afford to, and in the long run that will be a drag on the state and, and that will be a problem for everyone. Now to finish off, I'll uh, ask you to give a brief overview of the campaign performance of the, or well, not two, but three leaders. And uh, if you're only if you're comfortable, I'll ask you to make a final prediction. Sure. Okay. So you want an overview of the way the campaign's been run? Um, from the ALP point of view, it's been a disaster. Um, I couldn't believe that they were the ones who called the campaign in the first place. Uh, very slow out of the blocks, they didn't seem to know what their message was. And then they got sideswiped by this week over at Arnie, uh, which is an issue which um, um, is about jobs in North Queensland and you've got to be in favour of it up there. But in a lot of the South East, particularly the seats where the Greens are, it's about climate change and you've got to be against it. So they were derailed on that issue for a couple of weeks. Um, they've done a bit of a makeover of the Premier uh, and in my view they've made it a little bit too much like Kim Kardashian. It just doesn't gel. It doesn't look, in an election where people are looking for authenticity, um, it doesn't look good 
to suddenly change the way you look and, and start wearing a whole lot more makeup and so on. Got accused of being misogynistic the other day on radio. For a it's just an observation. Real it's it's just an observation that you know, no matter how much you dislike it, when a woman changes the makeup, she's doing it for a reason, uh, and in this case, it's been poorly judged. Um, so they they sort of hit their stride in the last couple of weeks. Um, there's a heavy negative against it, and, and Campbell is the is Banquo's ghost um, at this um, at this particular feast, um, but you know they haven't really given anyone a reason to give them a larger majority. They basically tried to run on their record, but they don't have much of a record to run on, so that doesn't work too well. So on the other side, you've got Tim. Now, Tim doesn't look particularly authentic either. Um, he looks like what he is, a suburban solicitor. He has trouble getting out of his suit and tie. Um, and, you know, I think his ties are pretty ordinary. Um, uh, he needed to somehow distance himself from the human legacy. So he needed a, to give a heartfelt apology. Now, we know what that looks like. And in fact, uh, uh, John Alexander has, has given a pretty good apology today for uh, an off-colour joke that he told 20 years ago when he was uh, much younger. Um, Tim didn't reach that level of sincerity and sorrow. Uh, and that's, that's a problem. Um, it's a problem because he, his delivery is of a piece. So he's very good at his lines, he's very good at a brief, but he doesn't come across as being exactly the real deal. Um, the LNP messaging has been a bit better. Um, certainly the two launches, the LNP pushed jobs, 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 and you could see that in the launch, uh, whereas Anastasia was a bit all over the place. Uh, Steve Dixon is the uh, nominal leader of One Nation, and, and interestingly, uh, while it's Pauline Hanson's One Nation, she's given him a fair bit of latitude to run as the leader. She's there. She's the fairy godmother. She's sprinkling the uh, ginger fairy dust over everything. Um, but, but he's been putting in a performance. He hasn't had to be told to get out of his, um, his suit and tie. He's there. And he actually comes across as the most authentic out of the three of them. I don't think he's going to win his seat of Butterham. He shouldn't win his seat of Butterham. It's not one nation territory. But I wouldn't be surprised if on Saturday night, one of the seats that I didn't pick is Butterham because he's actually done a very good job. Uh, he's exemplified the sort of politician that I think people are looking for. Now, I wouldn't go along with his policies, but his delivery uh, and his approach to the public, which has been open and, and humble. And he also did his own apology. Uh, which he handled pretty well. Um, has, yeah, it's been uh, been top notch from a campaign point of view. Um, so you've got the two major parties, neither of them convincing, uh, with um, um, sort of quick makeovers to, to try and, and fit the narrative that the campaign meisters have decided that they ought to follow. You've got One Nation uh, snapping and yapping around their heels. No one expects him to be any more than a terrier, and they're not doing a good impression of being a terrier. They are a terrier. So they're in a good position going into this election. The two major parties, their um, primary votes are in the doldrums. Uh, they're in trouble uh, in terms of winning in their own right. Um, so you asked me for my prediction. Uh, my prediction is that it is, at the moment, most likely it will be a rerun of we've got what we've got at the moment, but Labor will effectively have fewer seats because they'll have lost some to One Nation. And the Libs will have lost a few seats to One Nation, potentially some independents. Um, so it will possibly come down to the catters and maybe One Nation's to who forms government. Uh, um, but I've got a, uh, a feeling that um, Anastasia Palaszczuk is the one they're more likely to go with. And despite her promise that she won't do a deal with One Nation. She said exactly the same thing about independence and my before the last election. She's in government now, so she's got a track record. Well, Graham, I appreciate you offering your insights. So thank you for coming on the show today, and it'll certainly be a fascinating election night. Absolutely, a lot harder to pick than any other that I've uh, I've looked at. 
All right, everybody, that's the show for today. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, make sure that you join us for our Queensland Election Night live stream, which is Saturday the 25th of November 2017, starting at uh, 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Queensland is uh, an hour behind, so that'll be uh, 5 p.m. Queensland time. We'll be broadcasting on Facebook Live via the Unshackled Facebook page, and we have also set up a Facebook event page where we'll post updates about our coverage, so we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.